like to thank our panelists in advance, um, because I'm sure they're going to say something interesting. Um, our panel consists of, um, uh, starting up this side here with Don Bubar of um, Avalon Advanced Materials. Uh, we have uh, Adrian Griffin here of um, Lithium Australia. We have Kirill Clip of um, in Lith International Lithium Corp. And we have Tim McCutcheon from Wealth Minerals. Um, and the topic um, is a, rather a, an interesting one that we have here. It's lithium exploration slash m and market. And they're actually sort of, in my perception, two different issues. Um, because we haven't really seen any takeovers of lithium explorers. So I'd like to take these questions and um, then throw out to um, uh, our panelists here, um, what is the direction that lithium exploration will go along in the next um, several years? And what is going to be the evolution of the M&A situation in the space? Um, particularly in light of the fact that we've seen so little M&A up until now, are we going to see more or is it just not going to happen? Because um, if we go back and we look at the rare earth space, um, there was really, except for the, um, the Molycorp acquisition of Neo Materials, um, I can't think of another takeover of a rare earth company, uh, despite the fact that there were so many of them at one point. So is it going to be different in the lithium space? Interesting to look at there. Now, the, the, the big um, mother of M&A um, deals in the lithium space in the last decade was the Talison deal, um, where Talison was acquired by um, a, a Chinese group and Rockwood, and of course Rockwood was then taken over by Albemarle, and it was all wrapped up there. But um, So they sort of shared that ultimate ownership of that thing, but that was um, a deal that was over 700 million Australian dollars so it set the bar very high on um, M&A in the, in, the, um, in the lithium space. So uh, what I'll do is instead of dealing with the lithium exploration first, um, I will ask a question about the, um, the uh, M&A in the lithium space. And um, first I want to throw out an idea that's occurred to me, is that Tesla is the inevitable deal that probably won't happen. Um, now, by Tesla here, I don't mean Tesla getting taken over, but I mean Tesla being um, protagonist in the acquisition of um, companies in their uh, supply chain. And uh, they've steadfastly refused to um, not only uh, acquire companies in, in the, um, the battery and rare earth um, supply chains, um, but uh, they've actually walked away even from um, some deals like we saw uh, with Bacanora in um, in Mexico, and they just think that they're going to survive in just on time, just in time, and that people will provide them with the uh, the product because they're Tesla. Um, so I'd like to go through our, um, our, our panel here, starting with Don, and um, you know deal with this contention: is is Tesla um, uh, why is Tesla not being a protagonist in the space, um, and do we need to see them, or do we need to see them, or somebody else? become a protagonist uh, from the end users of the lithium batteries, lithium co um, ion batteries. Don. Well, I've never talked to them to fully understand what their strategy is on it. Um, it's, it is a bit difficult to understand looking at it from the outside in, given the um, critical importance of lithium and the formulation of the energy storage solution for their electric vehicles. I would have thought they would be a little bit more proactive than they have been in terms of securing uh, supply. Uh, presumably there is a strategy there uh, somewhere. Obviously they, um, they did have some strategy in terms of um, inspiring more investment in exploration through those MOUs they entered into with Pure Energy and, and Bacanora. That certainly did uh, inspire other players, explore, explorers, to start looking for opportunities to find lithium exploration properties and start investing in those. Uh, but their longer term strategy on um, securing supply, uh, I don't have any real insight and I wonder whether uh, they have really 
uh, thought it through from a security of supply uh, standpoint in the long term. And um, perhaps some of the other panelists have, have some further insight there. Kirill? Yes, uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Kirill Klip. I'm representing the International Lithium. It's a very interesting question, and uh, we all remember how Elon Musk called uh, our beloved lithium just a salt on a salad. But now I hope that this situation is changing because without that uh, salt, it's very difficult to digest any of that salad. And um, uh, what I can see in the industry, and I can talk a little bit on part of Chinese companies who are very aggressively building now the secure supply in our industry. And one of them, Ganfeng Lithium, is our co-stone investor, cornerstone investor, and uh, financing to our joint venture project. I can see that this m and is coming, and definitely at the moment it's below radar screens of the most investors, because this m and comes when companies like Ganfeng acquiring lithium takeoffs. We just witnessed recently the deal with Spielberg when they bought just 5% stake in the company, but securing 70% of supply from that company. Or another deal just recently, Lithium Americas, which is still subject to uh, approval by Chinese authorities, when again, uh, Genfeng is acquiring 20% in the company, and, but securing 70% of uptake with Lithium Americas. Or a case like with us, when uh, Genfeng has rights to 80% of our project in Mariana, where we just announce our resources. Uh, please tell me when to stop because I can throw uh, okay. well, we'll, quite we'll, a few numbers. We'll, yeah. we'll progress along. Mm -hmm. um, out of that comes the idea that um, are the Chinese the smartest guys in the room in the lithium space? Um, I t you know, if, if, there's a lot of publicity about Elon Musk and he's an innovator and he's the leading edge of things. Um, but uh, in the lithium mining side, um, is he falling behind? And the, um, the Chinese have got a real perception that there could be a brewing supply crisis and they're dealing with it. Um, what are your thoughts, Adrian? My view has always been there is no supply crisis. The world is certainly well resourced with respect to lithium. There's a, a supply chain bottleneck which at the moment exists in China, and it's the, the conversion capacity in China that's creating the shortage in the market. It's, it's certainly not a, a supply of raw materials. Uh, I'll make one comment with respect to Elon Musk and the ability to take over uh, companies further down the supply chain. I think to some extent uh, his current position is driven by US politics and the fact that he has an agreement with uh, two governments in the United States, the federal government and the, uh, the state government of Nevada, that to a large extent uh, compels Tesla to take many of those products from mine gate to motor vehicle. Well, if you're going to do that in North America, someone tell me who the lithium supplier is that you're going to take over. It's obvious that uh, those couple of deals that he did early in the piece were to satisfy those requirements. But at the moment, there aren't many people standing that you could take over to fill that space in North America. Uh, with respect to uh, the Chinese and them being the, the smartest guys in the room, I think you've only got to look at the strategy uh, with respect to the attack that they're having on the Australian lithium industry, and they really are everywhere, and mergers and acquisitions aren't something that hasn't happened in the past or the recent past. Just ask Chris Reed. Chris has been involved in uh, that sort of activity for some period of time, and I can tell you Perth is a very small community, and I can tell you it's full of Chinese people at the moment looking at lithium operations. Um, Tim, yeah. what, have you, do you have any comments about what the Chinese are doing? Well, I mean, I think one of the key things is there's two parts to your question. If you think about the Chinese and then Elon Musk, and it's sort of it captures the bigger whole. You know, Henry Ford used to own steel mills, and then he realized that was stupid, and he got rid of the steel mills. And uh, I think that the idea of Tesla owning a mining company or a mining operation uh, is, is not going to happen. Uh, I think it's very obvious that there's some synergies there, but I think the reality is it's not going to happen because 
there are plenty of people who are much better qualified to do it than an automaking company uh, or a, a battery company to do it. It's sort of like asking, you know, I, you know, Apple's not going to buy an aluminum plant because they use aluminum in their iPhones. Um, so. I think that the industry, at least industry observers, have been looking in the wrong direction. The automakers, you know, obviously aren't, I, I think, the, the natural partner, buyout partner, m and partner for the lithium industry. It's got to be so more people who are involved in the mining space. Frankly, I don't think it's the usual suspects in terms of, you know, BHP and Rio Tinto and those guys. I think it's more of the fertilizer companies because they actually have, uh, at least in the, in the lithium brine space, they actually have know-how when it comes to potassium and lithium. Um, so that's number one. Uh, the flip side, though, which may cause my prediction to be wrong, <laughs> is the problem with all the guys in all of these companies is they're all really smart ex-McKinsey uh, analysts, and they have very little concept of you know supply and demand. There's a demand curve and a supply curve, and they meet somewhere, and then there's a price, and everyone's happy. They don't realize that supply can fall off a cliff. They don't really see that that at a certain point, at any price, you're not going to get the lithium you need. I can understand uh, uh, Adrian here talking about that there's not a supply problem. I think in the long term, there probably isn't a supply problem. I think in the short term, there are some serious mismatches in terms of what people say they're going to do and what actually exists in the market today. Um, you know, we have BMW, Mercedes-Benz, BYD, all of these guys building uh, gigafactories. And I'll be damned if you can figure out where they're going to get the lithium for all this stuff. Um, so, in the short term, when the McKinsey consultants and internal guys are saying, oh, it's not a problem, you, gotta, you, know, you just go out and you put the commodity, you know. When I was in business school, commodities were poo-poo, that's what the losers do, commodities. They don't realize that if it's not there, it's not there. It doesn't matter how much money you throw at it. And I think that's going to be the main surprise and challenge for the industry is how can we make sure that there isn't, uh, it's, we, all, we like supply deficits because it makes prices higher. We don't like when su supply deficits are persistent because then it makes people look for other things. It's interesting that you mentioned Henry Ford there because, of course, um, Henry Ford built the steel plants so and I agree totally with you that um, he didn't really need to do it because the US was self-sufficient in iron ore production and it had its own steel mills. That was not a problem for Ford. He just wanted to be vertically integrated so that he had 100% control of his process. But if we look then at, um, at Tesla, can Tesla really put their hands on their heart, and, or Tesla or any of the auto manufacturers, I mean, we're making Tesla a bit of a whipping boy here, um, but uh, can they put their hands on the heart and say that they can be sure that they will be able to get as much um, lithium for the battery process, which it's, it's not, of course, Tesla that's making the batteries, it's Panasonic, who are a tenant within the Gigafactory. And if anything, it should be Panasonic that is um, acquiring. But it's, it's a corporate culture thing. Yeah, no, it's totally. Corporate it's, culture it's a, is commodities are what, you know, commodities, commodities. But that's, a, that's corporate fact, culture that has arisen buy. since the 1970s. If you go back, you would see the Goodyear, for instance, used to own rubber plantations. Yeah. Um, so that it could make the tires out of them. So um, was Goodyear wrong? Did Goodyear, when, when were Goodyear's best years? They were when it was a vertically integrated company. Now, now what is it? It's, it's basically been run out of business um, or reduced in its, um, its market share to, uh, um, to an also rep. Um, so if you don't protect your, um, your supply chain and you uh, rely upon um, uh, new upcoming producers who, as we've, we can see from Neo Metals and from um, various other companies, particularly Gan Feng, going and doing deals with all over the place, um, that um, the Chinese are going to have secured their supply. Tesla is relying on the power of prayer to get its, um, its uh, supplies of lithium. It's just hoping that a tiny little junior somewhere, and when, when it comes down to it, we're, we're looking at, you know, even companies um, with, you know, two or three hundred million market caps, um, are tiny in comparison to Tesla. That is the feet of clay of Tesla because they're relying upon really small companies that have very difficult um, fundraising situations um, to, um, as, as if these are guaranteed that these people will be able to get to the, um, to, the, uh, to the finish line and provide the product that they want. 
But well, let's move on from that there and um, let's have a look at the, the lithium exploration space. And I mentioned before the rare earth space, and of course, um, in the rare earth space, there were 300 companies, 200, 300, who knows, um, you know, the various numbers are bandied around. Um, can a panelist make a projection about, and, and, and you know, in broad numbers, not specifics, um, how many lithium juniors does the market actually need considering that the 300 um, rare earth companies have now been reduced down to like around 10 to 15. Um, so how many lithium juniors do we need? You want me to start? Yes, please. <clears throat> uh, well, I think the market will decide that at the end of the day. I think you're seeing a similar phenomenon as we saw with rare earths. I lived through both, as, as you know in that um, a lithium resource or occurrence of some consequence that might merit further exploration is not that hard to find. So an exploration company looking for a lithium asset to make a story around to, um, to do some promotion on raise capital and do some exploration uh, can find a lithium project to uh, explore relatively easily, just like we saw uh, rare earths. So there, I suspect there'll be lots of companies will enter the game because the, um, the, the sort of cost of opportunity to get into it is not that great. They're easy to find, um, early stage prospects and all over the world actually. But um, there will be an inevitable uh, shakeout down the road because there'll be, it'll be oversupplied with exploration properties that uh, many of which will, will not merit further development going forward. Maybe that creates uh, M&A uh, activity later on. There'll be a few good ones, obviously, and good discoveries that are made that will start to serve that market. But um, I'm seeing um, kind of similar phenomena as we saw with rare earths, although the big difference with rare earths compared to this lithium uh, interest now is that there's much more substance to it in terms of there being a real supply-demand uh, deficit that's... Um, creating the interest as opposed to it being mostly politics in China that created all the interest in rare earths 10 years ago. Kirill? Uh, yes, please. If I, if I may maybe touch on this conversation a little bit around, and definitely we have already a lot of uh, lithium wannabes, and I call it lithium 2.0. First one we have around 2009-2010 when it was, uh, it were more than 100 companies searching for lithium. But uh, I would like to give you a few numbers, maybe still a lot of people missing it. And number one will be why people missing, because we have total disconnect between the potential value or necessity of lithium as a critical commodity for our energy revolution and amount of money available in the West. For example, in 2016, all lithium market by sales was just $1 billion. Last December, all lithium market by sales was just $2.5 billion. It's enormous growth, but the market is so small. And now I will throw you a few numbers. And Chris will be the best person to talk later what it takes to put lithium mine into production. Uh, I will just give you top of my head, uh, let's say Lithium Americas, just confirm feasibility study, it will be $450 million CAPEX operation. Uh, new metals again, you can check this crease, but any kind of spodium production, it takes you to put in place five to seven years with a very good help of God and investors, and it will uh, bring you north of uh, half a billion dollars. So, we're talking about total disconnect in the West, and unfortunately, uh, I have to send this message to everybody here, that now we are at the total mercy of Chinese companies, and I'm not telling that it's bad or good, but I think that a lot of people still getting into the Tesla stories, they still only trying to understand uh, how many cars will be electric, I can tell you my personal message. I think that all cars will be electric and it means total dramatic change. At the moment, according to different studies, Chinese actually controlling 70% of lithium hydroxide market in the world. And this is the particular chemical which goes into Tesla batteries. Among two companies, Tianqi and Genfeng, 
they controlling uh, majority of this 70%. So when Tesla will wake up to this situation that actually NSA cathode is delivered to them still from Japan, even now, even when they build this gigafactory, I think unfortunately it will be too late because we have all these investors potentially here, all analysts here. But when you start to talk to the people and you throw in numbers, the market is so small that it takes us all this time, now almost 10 years from um, lithium uh, 1.0 to lithium 2.0 when people can really allocate enough capital for all those juniors uh, maybe now uh, north of 100 in the world searching for the lithium and maybe only 10 of them will put something into production so if i may yeah that's an interesting point there because um if we go back to the rare earth space again um the um within the, the first two years of the rare earth um boom, um, there were very large capital raises. And in the lithium space, which was really a boom of, of 2016, we saw a mere fraction of the amount of money that was raised in the, the rare earth boom. Now, of course, as we know, most of the money in the rare earth boom was actually lost. Um, but there are companies out there in the lithium space who are going to be the next generation. So we, we've got at the moment, you know, you've got the, the Neo Metals, You've got the Galaxies, you've got the Namaskas, uh, the Lithium Americas, etc., Oro Cobre, that came out of the, the, fir they're the children of the first lithium boom. Um, who are going to be the children of the second lithium boom? And, um, well, this is a bit of a loaded question for our panels because, of course, they're, they're going to think that they are. Um, but um, well, talk more about the dynamic, though, um, because there has been a lot less capital raised in this boom than there was back in the rare earth boom. And it means that many companies, in, in my perception, um, for instance, uh, we've, we've had a lot of companies have been doing uh, exploration light programs. They haven't been doing the PEAs and the PFSs. Maybe they're not in a position to do them, but there is a process where you do surface sampling, you do drilling, you do more drilling, um, you do a PEA, you get a resource estimate, then you move towards a PEA, PFS, blah, blah, blah. Um, but, you know, some of these parts of the process take two, three million dollars um, uh, more for the drilling than to just produce a document like a PEA can cost uh, three million dollars. Would, would you not agree? That's cheap. Okay, so it's cheap. Um, so they're going to need more money than that. But are the companies being given the money to do the first steps, the exploration? And I saw last year a lot of lithium juniors were able to do raises of 200,000, 300,000, 500,000. That was sort of keeping the lights on money. Um, it was not the type of money that would fund a really big program that would get you over the hill towards the PEA. Um, would you like to comment on, on how much money the space needs, the junior space needs, um, to do these various phases um, to, uh, to get towards um, being the next generation in three, four years from now of the, the, the subsequent um, uh, projects that are going to um, be added to this, this increasing demand. Because we know that these, these projects in Australia and Latin America are, are, are you know, going to be producing pretty shortly. Um, but then there'll need to be, you know, more. I'm not sure there does need to be more, but uh, if, I, if I can go back to the first part of your, your question, long ago, Chris, you've given a, a fairly yeah, extensive we'll commentary there. Sorry about that. Uh, and, the, and the question was, do we need the, the juniors there um, and will we see many of them disappear? I think the su supply chain is such that you don't actually need them there. And uh, this is not touring my own book, it's completely the opposite. But uh, I think if you, if you look at the, the structure of the industry and you talk about things like idle capacity, you've got to ask yourself, why is there one mine at the moment <coughs> producing 40% of the world's output on nine, nine shifts a fortnight? Why don't they put on 14 shifts a fortnight or why don't they go to three shifts a day? Because it's not required and you can't squeeze it through the system. And I think, um, in addition to that, one of those partners who will remain nameless has publicly said on numerous occasions that they will expand their output to such an extent that they will take up 
of all new global demand. Now that operation is decorporatising. It's going to a joint venture and if one partner takes 50% of all new demand, how much does the other partner take when it's a 50-50 joint venture? That's pretty easy. They take the other 50%. So there's, there's a lot out there and do we need to add to it? Uh, the answer is at the moment, I believe, no. Does that mean we don't need the juniors? The answer to that clearly is also no, because long term it's the juniors that produce all of the new opportunities. The large companies don't do it, and I guess the lithium market, as has been said, is actually a very small market in terms of uh, total cash generated, and it's not the normal modus operandi for a large company, so it's not going to attract the Anglos, the BHPs, Rio is probably an exception because of the, the deposit that they've got in Serbia. But that aside, it's not the sort of industry that, that does attract those large companies and as a consequence that creates the niche for the juniors. Tim? Yeah, I, a, few, a few comments. I mean, one, uh, the financial markets are different. Since 2008, the world's changed and, and we had a little bit of an echo situation between 2009 to 2012. The reality is that in general though, the, you know, the, the lawyer in Zurich or the doctor in London who would take out a mortgage in his house for half a million and put it into junior expiration because he'd make the spread between the more, that doesn't happen anymore. Um, the money's gone. Um, and so, you know, the, the liquidity that was available for speculative play as a small portion of a larger portfolio of the world's investment appetite that's gone. Uh, the world's completely different than it was not that long ago. I mean, all you got to do is look at how many, you know, look at all of the investment banks. They're all downsizing um, because it's just that market doesn't exist anymore. Um, as far as the need for juniors, um, you know, there, there's definitely a need for what what everyone in the industry fears is someone going out there, raising a lot of money, being really well promoted and then blowing up because that will discredit everyone else. That's what I think we all are nervous about um, because the access to capital uh, for no reason, for no fault of our own will then you know, basically dry up or be much more restricted. But, um, but barring that, you know, at the end of the day, the reality is, is it's not 2007 anymore. You know? um, and as far as, as you know, the supply and demand situation and everything else, I have a, I used to be an equity analyst for many, many years, and I remember, you know, you would look at things and you'd be told a certain story, and then you'd ask yourself questions where the answers didn't make any sense, which meant that your underlying assumptions were probably wrong. Green bushes is 40% of the world's production, right? Uh, green bushes cash cost is a little over $4,000 a ton of LCE, right? What's lithium trading at nowadays? Even if we include they're gonna block it in, the long-term prices and everything else, it's significantly above $4,000 a ton. So the question I ask myself is, as far as I know, everyone likes making money. So are they not ramping up because it's some grand master plan? that It, it doesn't make sense to me. Which, which leads me to believe that they're not ramping up to the, you know, they haven't done it as fast as they could because they can't. I, I think there's something there that, that we don't know about because it doesn't make sense for me that if their cash costs are $4,000 a ton LCE, and LCE is trading at multiples of that, that they're not going to eat into that and make money. You raise a good point, though, that goes far beyond the, the, um, the space of just lithium, and that is that there is a different scenario now, there's a different landscape out there, not just for lithium juniors, but for all um, specialty metal companies, and even beyond specialty metals, into uh, in gold and other um, uh, minerals um, that... Uh, a certain category of investor has been either vaporised or retired or died or traumatised and um, they're no longer with us. So we, um, we're now dependent upon a market that's... Um, where, where's the money going to come from to fund these juniors? It's, it's the same people, it's just that whereas before maybe you had a Rolodex of 1,000, now it's a Rolodex of 200. You know, uh, it, it used to be, you know, you have multiple, multiple mid-tier investment banks with a desk of people running around on the phone raising you. They're all gone. They're all gone. I mean, look, go look at, you know, particularly in London, because I have a lot more experience in London in terms of those desks. 
they're gone. And you look in Canada, you know, the, the, the acquisitions, the mergers that have been happening, everything else has basically raised the, the floor of a size of a deal that is now acceptable to a bank is a lot higher than it used to be because the, of the mergers and acquisitions in the banking industry. So, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a different world. I mean, it's a completely different world. Let's not fool ourselves. So, um, do we have any questions for our panelists on the on these two subjects of M um, and A in the lithium space and um, and uh, which way the lithium explorers are going to go? There's a question down there at the back. I'm going to get right back over to you, Bob. I just want to ask you, Christopher, can you confirm was this a statement or a question? Tesla is relying on the power of prayer to secure uh, their lithium. Yeah, that's a statement. One of the opening uh, panelists had suggested that the conversion capacity is the bottleneck, not the raw material or not access to the raw material. I just wonder if we can get a bit more color on that as to, okay, how much is the conversion capacity bottleneck? Is it 50%? And how long would it take? And I assume the bottleneck is in China, maybe? And again, how long to fix that up? Yeah, well, let, let me say, firstly, that the only conversion capacity at the moment is in China. Um, so it, and really, the, there aren't that many uh, concentrate producers around the world at the moment. The, there are more coming on stream, of course. Uh, and I think uh, China has the ability to build uh, a new converter in about 18 months. They're very quick at doing the, uh, the construction work and they've, they've dealt with the technology for a long period of time. Uh, with respect to uh, how much conversion capacity have they got and how much does it constrain the market. To some extent it depends on the, the quality of the material that they feed. Um, in that they have to downgrade capacity to some extent for uh, concentrates that come from certain sources or have certain physical characteristics. So most of the capacity is used but what's its utilisation is probably about 60% of what it was designed for simply because of the nature of the material. But be that as, as it may, most of it is being used. Um, with respect to where uh, the additional material may come from uh, to fill capacity or generate new capacity, uh, I, th I think we're looking at, uh, and I did mention the, the decorporatisation of uh, green bushes and it's interesting because it's not a reporting entity anymore. It's a little bit difficult to uh, get information, but uh, we hear a lot on the local scene in Western Australia with respect to that and other operations. And I, I think it's fair to say that they, they've started the increase in capacity as a consequence of Tianchi building their uh, lithium hydroxide plant uh, at Kwinana, just south of Perth. That will be followed by Albemarle doing the same thing. That looks like a doubling of capacity. Uh, and if rumours are to have it right, uh, there's a lot more on the drawing boards. Perhaps uh, there are people already to put the nuts and bolts together on the, uh, the second expansion. Uh, so there, there's a lot there. And then there are the other producers coming on stream in Western Australia. Uh, of course, there's. Uh, uh, Chris Reed's material coming out of Mount Marion, which has been very successful and really at the moment hasn't had a market impact because it's so new. Uh, same applies to Galaxy and Pilbara and we have mineral resources doing almost the unthinkable and, and uh, shipping, so-called direct shipping ore at 1.2% uh, into China in vast quantities at the moment. Uh, so there is plenty of capacity around and it will fill up the, uh, any surplus in those conver converters if they can squeeze more through. But that's an interesting point you raised there because it sounds, if the bottlenecking was, the bottleneck was in China before, now some of the new plants are being built outside China to solve that problem. Oh yeah, and I think to some extent that's tax driven because of the, uh, uh, the impost put on uh, Chinese producers exporting lithium chemicals from China to the rest of the world, and that impost is pretty high. And so if you can build uh, a Chinese plant outside China, which Tianchi are doing at, uh, at Kunana, uh, and sell into, say, Korea, Japan, uh, North America, wherever it may be, but sell into a destination outside China, uh, you increase your profit margin enormously. So it's not surprising that they're doing that. More questions? Any other questions? Observations? No? Well, I want to ask Adrian a question. 
Adrian, um, you know, Lithium Australia is really, frankly, one of the leaders for uh, acquisitions for junior lithium exploration plays uh, on the planet. Can you tell me what we should anticipate as shareholders, say, in the next couple of quarters? Are we going to continue this uh, aggressive uh, strategy? Can you comment? Well, yeah, there are a number of facets, facets to that, and we have at the moment, I think, uh, seven projects in Western Australia, one in Northern Territory, three in Queensland, two in South Australia, uh, one in Mexico, uh, one in Germany and six in Canada. So it's, it's a fairly hefty portfolio. And most of that has been done by uh, joint ventures and various types of agreements with, with other parties. We currently have uh, a takeover bid on the table for uh, Lapidico. Uh, which is another Perth-based company, primarily technology organiser. Uh, I, I, I want to see all of the technology, and to get back to the earlier panel, I want to see all of that technology under one roof, so we no longer have just the first and second best, we have one, two and three. Um, so look forward to more on the, the, the merger front there. With respect to the, the exploration, we're currently drilling in uh, Mexico, and uh, that's on a lithium so-called clay deposit and for the uh, geologists or technologists in the audience may I say that uh, clays ain't clays necessarily uh, and we don't quite know what the lithium's in but it's not in clay in the most part. Uh, so they're interesting deposits and we're looking for a technical solution that's uh, capable of processing those at lower cost and I, I think within the next few months subject to some changes in the uh, the, the mining law in Germany will start drilling there as well. I'd like to thank our panellists for participating here today and um, look forward to hearing the individual presentations later on. Thank you.